Happy Easter. If you're looking for a seat, we've got a bunch over here behind the youth group, so you can come over to this side, and uh, there's lots of seats over here. We're so glad that everyone is here today. Uh, we know a lot of you are visiting. We're very excited that you are with us. Uh, I would ask a favor. Actually, this is kind of a special request, because you probably don't know this, but the Connect cards that we talk about every week and the online version, Miss Tina like puts all of those in Alexio every Sunday. So I just want to experiment and see how long we could make it take for her to put all of those in. So if everybody does this, I will report back later. We'll see if it's like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I don't know when she'll get finished. But um, she puts all of those in and sends those out to the shepherds and the ministers so we know that you are here and we can be praying for you. So we, we hope that you'll do that. On the card, you will also find a, a QR code, which is up on the screen behind me. You can scan that for um, today's Uversion event, and you can follow along there. And then we also have uh, sheet music. If you want sheet music, it's outside with Miss Tina. So you can, you can go grab that and tell her that she's got a long day ahead of her after, after this morning. Um, <laughs> we're so excited you're here. Uh, we, we, we just hope that this morning is a tremendous blessing for you. And as we enter into our worship now, um, I was reminded of these words this morning. One day, every knee will bow. One day, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But the greatest treasure 
remains for those who gladly choose him now. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye hands now, earth reply.
Would you be seated, please? On this reading, uh, would you join us on the bold words? <clears throat> on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is, he is not, not here. here. He, he has, has risen. risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Where, where, where O oh death, is, is your victory? Where, where O oh death, is, is your sting? sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. I'd like to invite the chorus uh, to come on up and take their places.
its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave. Yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living I don't know why I wasn't invited to sing in that group. <laughs> Maynard, <laughs> you know why, yeah. We have been blessed over the last few days, certainly. Friday evening, uh, I understand John Hodges really put this together, but we had a wonderful uh, Good Friday service Friday evening. And it was very inspirational. And, and David, finally, we got everybody to be quiet when we left. I know it was hard when we first walked in because everybody wants to greet one another and so forth. So it was a very inspirational service, and uh, I appreciate the effort that went into that. This was wonderful this morning. The service has been great. And I appreciate each person that's here this morning. I've got one request today. All of you that's here this morning, come back next Sunday morning at the same time. So uh, we would welcome you, uh, welcome you here. Uh, let me just mention three or four names, and I always uh, hesitate to do this because I'll leave somebody out. But uh, our brother Jack White has not been well at all. Was uh, Taken to the hospital, I believe it was uh, Friday evening, I think. But either way, he had to spend a couple of days in the hospital. Don't know if he's home yet or not. But Jack, uh, as you know, has uh, uh, MS, and he's not uh, not doing well at all. Ron Wolf, uh, we continue to pray for Ron. He's uh, continuing to undergo care for the cancer. Rita Campbell, uh, we want to pray for Rita. Rita, are you here this morning? Where's I don't see Al. But anyway, we were? Oh, okay. She's online. So, Rita, we love you. And we're all praying for you. And hopefully you uh, get uh, get the treatment you need very soon. Barry Lindsay has had some uh, surgery on her knee. And she's recuperating at home also. Neil Shaver. Uh, <laughs> 
Neil was supposed to have surgery on his knee and have it replaced tomorrow morning. But because of his heart issues, the cardiologist has not given him permission, so he's been put off. And that's just the way sometimes we, uh, we, we, we get the news is we can't do it yet. So uh, Neil is uh, looking forward to knee surgery then the 28th of this month, I believe. Let's go to Father in prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for you. Our almighty Father, our Savior, we love you, Father. And we know that today is a very special day to many people, many people in the world, because we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Father, although we celebrate that uh, resurrection every day and every week, today is a special day. It's on that third day that your son broke the bounds of death and left the tomb and was resurrected. And when his, uh, when his uh, brothers and sisters came to the tomb, he wasn't there. And Father, that is a reason that we have this great hope that we have in you. Father, you've given us the gift of salvation. And for that, we are so grateful. Your grace extends to all men and all women and all people at all times, Father. And we are grateful for that. Father, we know that we, we were in that crowd the day that Jesus Christ was crucified. Father, he bore our sins on that cross. And Father, as long as we remain faithful to you, that's where they stay. And we're so grateful for that, Father. Father, we pray for our church family. We pray that your spirit will be among us this morning. Father, we pray for our, our shepherds. We pray for the process that we're going through now to select new shepherds. And Father, we pray for us for our ministers here at Northside, and we just, we just love each one of them so much, Father, and appreciate the work that they do. Uh, we appreciate our brother David, and we ask that you are with him this morning, and that your spirit talks through him to us as we celebrate the risen Lord. Father, once again, we ask for forgiveness. We ask that we uh, love you more, that we love our brothers and sisters more, and we ask that we love our neighbors more, Father. And we do this by showing them Jesus Christ in our lives. Is our prayer in His high and holy name. Amen. I'll be reading from John chapter 11, verses 17 through 45 the story of the raising of Lazarus. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. 
But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips and linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. When I think of the long litany of illness that we have on our prayer list, and the fact that that is always the case, I am deeply grateful for Resurrection Sunday. Amen? Amen. There will come a day when you and I will no longer experience any illness, and we will no longer experience any pain, and there will be no heartache, and God will call us home to be with him. That is what we celebrate today. Today we celebrate the defeat, the death of death. You know, we talked earlier about there are a lot of people that are joining us online. I want to mention one. Uh, Stacy Kling is actually watching right now in Shanghai, China. Uh, Stacy is a, a young woman, that, a woman that's grown up in this church. Paul Kling's, Paul and uh, Laura Kling's uh, daughter. And so we just say, hello, Stacy. Glad to see you. We're glad you're here. It's 1030 tonight in Shanghai, if that makes any sense to you. Uh, thank you for co- joining us and, and uh, for this celebration of Easter. You know, what's weird is that when I was little, uh, I, I went to a church that didn't celebrate uh, any holidays. At Easter, there was no banner in the churchyard that said, join us for Easter Sunday. Uh, at my church, in the church house, there was no banner that said, he is risen. We didn't believe that there should be any special celebration of those holidays. And if you want the long history of that, come and get with me afterwards. It's really not that important. Now, ironically, we did believe in and celebrate the Easter Bunny. Uh, every Easter Sunday... We would run down, we would, we would run to the, out of our rooms and into the kitchen or wherever it was to see what the Easter bunny had left us. And we would see the treasure trove of candy and the things that, that uh, the Easter bunny left. I always wanted uh, one of those chocolate uh, bunnies with the long ears so you could eat the ears off. Anyway, I, 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 that's probably psychological, but I don't know. Anyway, um, but then we would all get dressed, usually in new clothes. Uh, because you'd go out, your parents would go out and buy new clothes for Easter. Uh, I know at one time, you know, white shoes were really big. and uh, But anyway, we would, and so were leisure suits back in my day. So uh, anyway, uh, I just didn't even think about that. But we, we, would, we would go to church. And I know a lot of the women back in my day, when I was little, they'd wear hats. Uh, and everybody would be dressed in their Sunday best. And then after church, you'd have a good church service that didn't have anything to do with Easter. Uh, and then you'd go home. Uh, and you'd have a nice family meal together, and then the parents, the, the adults would go outside and hide the eggs, and then we would have an Easter egg hunt after lunch on Sunday. Now, understand me, I don't think there's anything wrong with any of that. Uh, we did that this morning at, at our house. My grandkids are here, so we did that at our house this morning. But I am so glad that times have changed. Because friends, Easter's not just a holiday, Easter is ultimately a person. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's a great question. That's a great question. 
And he's not saying, Martha, do you believe in a doctrine? Martha, do you, Martha, do you believe in an idea? He's saying, do you believe who I am? Because Easter is ultimately not a holiday. Easter is not a concept. Easter is a person to trust. And that's the question we all face today, each one of us. Do you believe the Easter person? Do you believe Jesus? Now, after Jesus rose from the dead, one of the events all of his disciples would have thought of and remembered was what happened just a few days earlier in Bethany when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. When he brought this great joy back into the, uh, Lazarus' sister's lives, Mary and Martha, and brought him back from the dead. And, and this Resurrection Sunday, I want us to reflect on some of the things that Jesus said, because these things are of ultimate importance for all of us who believe in Jesus. And so let me share with you three things that he said. The first thing he said was, take away the stone. And when he did this, he's giving them hope because the voice of doubt was loud that day. Martha had said this, and he's been, in, he's been dead four days. If you go up to the tomb, you open the tomb, it'll smell like somebody that's been dead four days. And in essence, what Martha was saying was, Jesus, you're just too late. And let's be honest, at some point, we've all told God, he's too late. We've all had days when we've given up and said, God, Jesus, you're too late. You see, we live in a, we live in a fourth day kind of world. We live in a fourth day kind of world. We've all had those days when we thought, we said to ourselves, I'll never get well. We've all said, I'll never get out of debt. I'll never find a job. I'll never get over what they did to me. My marriage will never get better. My child will never straighten up. We will never have kids. So my question to you is, what was your fourth day? When you gave up and said, God, you're too late. You know, since we live in a fourth day kind of world, there is great pressure upon us to kind of take things as they are and agree with the status quo and agree that decay will have its day. And so on Easter Sunday, we must decide if we will allow the hum of a fallen world to override the voice of a risen Savior. Jesus was asking them, and he's asking us to take a step in the direction of hope. I love what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. In God's great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope. Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and now we hope for the blessings God has given for his children. Easter people, you and I, those of us who have committed ourselves to Jesus Christ, we are hopeful people. And hope is not just positive thinking. Hope is not saying, I, hey, listen, I'm just going to try harder and I'm going to try harder and things will get better the next time. No, hope is a passionate belief in what Jesus can do because, friend, Jesus is no respecter of stones. He is a rescuer of those who are trapped behind them. So Jesus said, you take away the stone. And then he said, Lazarus, come out. And I agree with the old preacher who said, he said, Lazarus, come out, because if he just said, come out, all the dead people would have come up, right? <laughs> so, and, so at the, and by the way, there's going to come a time when he's going to shout your name, Hallelujah. and you're all, we're all going to come up. But on this day, he just wanted Lazarus back. And so Jesus is calling us out. We read John eleven thirty five. 35. Kim read John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. And I often wondered, why did Jesus weep? I mean, he knew what he was about to do, didn't he? He knew that in just a moment... 
Lazarus was going to be walking around again among his loved ones and that all of the sadness and pain that they had been experiencing for the past four days was going to be relieved. He knew that, didn't he? Well, I've come to believe that the reason he cried was because Jesus was deeply upset as he came face to face with what sin had done to the divine intent. What God intended. Because Jesus was there, right? Jesus was there when God created the world. Jesus saw how good the world was. He saw a world that, that shouldn't have hospitals, that wouldn't have hospitals, a world that wouldn't have prisons, a world that wouldn't have courts, a, a world that wouldn't have cancer wards. He knew the creation was good. That's not the, but what he was seeing was not the world his father made. It's the world that sin had messed up. And here's what's really important. Before he could defeat death, Jesus knew that he had to defeat sin. And that's why the biggest test Jesus ever faced was not an empty tomb. It was an unoccupied cross. Romans 4 verse 25 says Jesus was given to die for our sins and he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. You see, sin, what sin did was introduce death into the whole world. God said in the very beginning, I'm giving you life, but if you disobey me and you rebel against me, you're going to die because he is the author, the source of life. And when you're disconnected from God, you're disconnected from real eternal life. That's why Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. Now, the world doesn't think it's dead. And the reason the world doesn't think it's dead is because in the world, deadness is normal. And when you live in deadness, and that is normal for you, it feels normal. But the reality is, the world is cut off from the life of God. And the question is this, what can a dead person do to save themselves? And there's only one right answer. The answer is nothing. There is not one thing a dead person can do to save themselves. Do you understand that if you are dead in your sins, you are dead? You can be rich dead or poor dead, you can be Republican dead or Democrat dead, but dead is dead. And you cannot do anything to save yourself. And so when Jesus stood there before the tomb and said, Lazarus, you come out, in the very word of command was the power to enable him to respond to the command. That means that God who's calling us from death into life can, in fact, give us the very life we need to respond to the call. And so Paul says in Ephesians 2 a little bit later, and God is, is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when we were raised with Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. So listen to me, if you're saved today, if you've received new life in Christ today, would you agree that we live in a divided world? Would you agree that we spend a lot of time mad at each other? Yeah. And looking down on others? Would you agree that that's kind of the, the, the world that we live in, that, that, that the, the word that describes most of the world in which we live today is outrage. Someone's always outraged about something. But if you're, you have life in Christ and you've been born again, what that means is you don't look down on anybody. You don't judge anybody. You don't condemn anybody. Because you know the only way that you have been saved is by the grace of God. Because the only people God saves are dead people. And I'll tell you, there's no reason, I'll say this too, there is no reason for you to live one more day in your deadness. If you're not a Christian this morning, you don't have to spend one more day in the deadness that feels normal to you, but is not. And it's not up for you to do something. 
It's up for you to respond to the call of Jesus. By the way, that call is going to be made someday. And it's also being made today. Jesus is calling you today. And that call is not just to come out of a tomb, but it's also to leave your clothes. Because when he called Lazarus out, that's what Lazarus did. Let me try to explain this. Because the third thing that Jesus said was, you take off the grave clothes and you let him go. Because Easter means that Jesus is setting us loose. Let me try to explain. I think the story of Christopher Miller might help. The unusual story. He was arrested in Toms River, New Jersey for robbing a stride right shoe store. And he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. When he got out after 15 years, he took a bus back to Toms River, New Jersey. He went to that same store and he robbed it again. He took cash. He took the cell phones of the workers who were there and some of the, the people who were there. And then he ran out of the store and ran down the street. He threw the money in the gutter. He threw the cell phones in the trash, and a few blocks later, he was arrested again. Because, as the sheriff said, Christopher has no idea what to do with freedom. He really only knows life behind bars, and he wants to stay there. And the point is that there are a lot of Christians who are just like that. We're saved... We've been raised to new life in Christ. But we're still bound in garments of death. You need to know that you've been set free. If you're a Christian this morning, you need to know that you've been called out of deadness to freedom. And, and, and that Jesus came to redeem us, but also to release us for we, so that we can become what God intended us to be. In other words, you don't, you don't get free free and then come to Jesus, you come to Jesus and you get set free. Well, here's what that means. Let me try to explain. What that means is I don't have to live in bondage to anger. I don't have to live in bondage to my appetites. I don't have to live in a prison of my lusts. You don't have to live in your jail cell of greed or a bad attitude. You don't have to live in the prison of what you did or of what someone did to you. You don't have to keep living in a prison that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has unlocked. And folks, it's not about grit and willpower and trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps to make yourself better. It's about believing and trusting that the resurrection of Jesus can break every chain and everyone can come free. From bondage. There's a story from World War II about American soldiers in a Japanese POW camp I think is instructive. Uh, if you've read any history of World War II, you know that the, the Japanese POW camps were, the captivity was horrendous. Uh, they were starved. They were tortured. Uh, they were refused medical treatment. Uh, the guards would mock them. Uh, deceive them. Uh, and so finally when the camp was liberated and the good news started to spread that they were going to be free, there were some who just didn't believe it. One of the consequences of their captivity and the poor diet that they had is that, they, that many men would lose their sight. So there was this one captain from Alabama who was almost completely blind because of the poor diet that he'd suffered while he was in prison. And so when he heard the, the news, and people started to talk about the fact that they were going to be set free, he didn't believe it. He just didn't believe it. He didn't think there was any way that that could be true. And so what they did is they found another soldier from Alabama who had that deep southern drawl. And he went to that captain and said, Captain, why don't you move? Don't you want to be free? And a smile crept over his face because he heard a voice he could trust. Now, folks, Easter 
is a person to trust. And freedom is a promise to wear. But you're going to have to listen to his voice. Many of y'all know about Booker T. Washington. One more story, then we're going to be done. Uh, Booker T. Washington uh, grew up on a plantation as a slave. And and he wrote that the the worst sound in his life was every morning before sunup when the rooster in the yard would start crowing because what that rooster signified to him was slavery. It meant that another day of back-breaking work was beginning. And so he ju- that, that rooster became the voice, the sound of slavery. Well, one day a new voice came into the plantation and there was, they found out that there was a man named Abraham Lincoln who had signed something called the, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation and said that slavery was over and they celebrated. But the next morning, that rooster crowed again. But this time it sounded different, he said. And he looked out the window And his mama was outside chasing that rooster with an ax. And they ended up having a chicken fried dinner. And they put to death the voice of slavery in their lives. You can too. You hear me? You can too. You can put to death the voice of slavery in your own life. Because Easter, it's not a day. It's not a holiday. It's not a doctrine. It's a person. And he's calling your name. You don't have to live one more day in deadness. You don't have to live one more day in prison. And if we somehow can help you, We'll baptize you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray over you. If there's anything we can do to help you, we will do that today. Let's stand up. Let's sing. Buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Till I met you, I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb. Till I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. You call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Now your mercy has saved my soul, now your freedom is all.
Several years ago, uh, there was a movie uh, many of us saw and many of us loved. And I don't want my comments to rob you of the power of that, of that movie, but I do want to make a point. The movie was the Mel Gibson uh, movie, uh, The Passion of the Christ. And a part of the focus of that movie was how much pain Jesus endured. And there is no question, there was pain. But in the texts about the crucifixion in scripture, Pain, the pain that Jesus endured, while it may be implied, is not the point. Because Jesus did not die to remove our pain. We will experience pain in our life, some more than others. Being a Christian does not remove from our lives any of the pain of being human. The Hebrews writer says in Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross and scorned the shame. There is a difference in pain and shame. And God has never wanted his children to be living in shame. You remember the story of Adam and Eve? When they sinned, their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked and were ashamed. And God did not want them to live in shame. And God became the first seamstress and knit them an apron to cover their shame so that they would not be ashamed. God has never wanted us to live in shame. God has never shamed his people. What Jesus bore on the cross was not our pain, as deep as our pain might be, but he bore our shame. And what it means to take the Lord's Supper, especially on a day like today, especially on a day in which the person of Easter, the one who called himself the resurrection and the life, has not only broken free from the grave in which he was lying buried, but has broken 
the chains of our own bondage to shame. Some of us live every day with a shame of things we've done, things we have thought, things we have said, things we should not have said or done or thought. Some of us live in the bondage of shame because of people we have hurt in lives that we have made painful. We live in the consequence of those things, but God will not allow us to remain in our shame. Through Christ and out of the resurrection, God is saying to all of us today, I don't care what you have done. My son died for you. And you may live today, this day, fully and completely free from shame. Because God has freed you to be his daughters and his sons. And so we take this bread and this cup as a sign of our freedom. Eating and drinking today with a resurrected Christ. In honor of his death and resurrection. But in celebration of our own. Let's take of the bread first and do so as an act of freedom and thanksgiving. Father, for this bread, we give you thanks. And in it, we recognize not only our brokenness, but that our Savior was also broken. And then in Christ's brokenness, he has liberated us from our own. Through it, Father, we pray that we may have life and hope and a future today and from now on through Jesus without shame. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The body of Christ. For this cup, Father, we give thanks and receive with gratitude your mercy. Because of our own sins, your son's blood was shed. And he endured the cross for our sakes and scorned our shame. And so, Father, may we take this cup, this blood of the new covenant, that in receiving it and drinking from it, we today might receive Life indeed shared in the resurrection of your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. That is the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. We do thank you for being with us this morning. We, we encourage you to uh, stick around for classes. If you're here in person, we have a number of really good classes that are going on right now. Holy Spirit Unrestrained uh, is uh, in room 238 upstairs. Uh, Jack Reese is doing a study of his uh, newest book, <clears throat> At the Blue Hole, in the fellowship room right across. I will tell you that love, if you're in the 239 Dexter Freeman's class, love does uh, that class is not meeting today because Dexter is with his family. They're uh, mourning the uh, passing of his stepfather. Uh, so those that of you that go to that class will need to just uh, uh, spread out among the, the other classes. <clears throat> and then there's a class in room 240 reading scripture. That's not the way I read it. And so we want to encourage you to go that. We have a, a pathways study. It's a, a, a Bible study for women in various seasons of life. Uh, including those who attend church alone, and they meet at 1030 <clears throat> in room 220, and they're studying life lessons from John. You can get more info from Kelly Eford or from Selena Lopez. Uh, we encourage you to make your offering uh, today before you leave. You can put them in the offering boxes, or you can give online, or you can text an amount to that number, <clears throat> or you can always mail a check to the church building. Uh, Wednesday nights, uh, we, we find ourselves trying to kind of figure out a new normal and a, a kind of reimagine, re-envision uh, what we're doing on Wednesday nights. Uh, this Wednesday night, April 20th, the praise team will rehearse, begin rehearsing weekly at 7 p.m. here at the building. Uh, everybody's welcome to attend. If You don't have to be on the praise team. If you'd just like to learn new songs and if you'd like to sing, then you're welcome to be with us for that. Uh, they'll be learning new songs, digging into to songs that we already know, working on fundamentals and technique, and uh, t talk sometimes about the meaning and history of some of the songs that we sing. And then in the coming weeks, we look forward to more uh, special event projects like the Ukraine uh, project or the prayer walk that we just had. Uh, but we will be taking a, a break from a weekly adult Bible class on Wednesdays. But if you've got a group that wants to come up here and utilize our, our facility and our, our spaces, it may be for a, a Bible study, it may be for a discussion group, it could be a life group, it could be uh, for you want to be here for prayer, the prayer rooms will be open, um, and, or you can just come and you can fellowship. But the atrium uh, will be open on Wednesday nights uh, to, so that we can connect and grow uh, closer to one another. Uh, and in that vein, mark your calendars for Wednesday, June the 29th. We're going to have a special congregation-wide summer get-together. You'll have more information on that as it goes along. But that's Wednesday, June the 29th. One, a couple of things. Join us for Praise in the Plaza. Uh, on, uh, we're featuring Engage uh, Saturday the 23rd at 5 p.m. This is the Plaza at Concord, Por Concord Park, 700 East Sonterra Boulevard. Uh, you can go grab a meal at uh, any of the, the restaurants that are there, uh, but join us for that. Bless the business owners that are there uh, and come listen to wonderful worship. Uh, we want to let you know that there's going to be a shepherd sharing next Sunday night at 5 p.m. We haven't had one of these for a while, but our next shepherd sharing will be at 5 p.m. next Sunday. And so now would you just join me in prayer before our last song? Holy Father, we 
we love you so much. You're so good to us. You've given us your son. You've freed us from shame and sin. Father, help us to live into the life that you have given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come when I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done? Is that his voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week.